the stone. Let's talk about the stone and what it should mean to us. And I want to tell you right away, we're going to talk about the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected. And you all know that's Christ, okay? And um, he is uh, a stone that we're going to depend on. We're going to pick up where we left off at last Passover concerning the beast, okay? The governments, the systems. So open your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. Nothing is new under the sun, and that that has been shall be. Our Father has foretold us all things. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Almighty God speaking to the serpent, our enemy. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, the serpent bruised the heel of Christ when he was nailed to the cross. Turn with me now on to Daniel chapter 2. Minor prophets. I want you to see a picture of this system. Now, in the last Passover, we took this system as it was kingdom, seven kingdoms. And we're going to pick it up there and we're going to look at kings now. Why? Because Nebuchadnezzar was given a dream and he was showing a great image. Golden head, uh, silver, and so on. And we're going to pick it up there and I want you to get a real good look at this being. Now, it is true that the kingdom stretched out over a long period of time, right up till today. But um, there was a time at the end that the whole thing came back as a composite from head to toe. And Jesus Christ himself, the cornerstone, would be cast into this thing and destroy it all at one time. So what I'm saying is we're going to move this ahead and look at the composite of the overall rather than taking it through the governments and kingdoms, if you wish, that we did at the last Passover. So get set for that. And we're going to go into the destruction of this thing. Pick it up with me, if you would, at verse 35 in chapter 2. Verse 35 reads, and this is uh, Nebuchadnezzar being shown the dream and Daniel interpreting it. 35, uh, there then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken in pieces, two pieces together and became like the chaff of summer thrashing floors. Hey, that's tore up pretty good. You understand? And the wind carried them away and no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And of course, that is Christ. And his kingdom will fill the whole earth, and you know what? You're going to be a part of it. That's important. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords. But we got a little work to do yet, and our Father wants you to be aware. Okay, 36. This is the dream. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heavens hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. Who gave it to him? God did. God, don't ever forget, you never have to fear or worry because God's in control, even of our enemy. Okay? He only allows them to go so far. And even at that, he gives you power over them. Okay? Verse 38. And wheresoever the children of men dwell the beast of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand and hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. And of course, amplify this now. Again, I want you to think and bring this up to date where we have a composite of the whole thing 
and it makes up the Antichrist system, okay? Again, I will repeat, yes, it was nations at one time, but we're in the last days. And I want you to picture the time that the head cornerstone breaks the feet and brings down Mystery Babylon of the great book of Revelation. Um, verse 39, and after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over the earth. In other words, this is the secession, one after the other. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces and subdueth all things. And as iron that breaketh in all the, that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. Now, now come awake for me. This is important. It's going to get heavy. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. Now, um, what is your buddy made of? Clay, okay? We are mortal beings, and we have clay bodies. Now, you're going to have to get used to thinking in those terms to understand this. Next verse. And as the toes, we don't hear much about the toes, do we? As of the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. This word broken is brittle. Uh, you know, iron will give something a structure that makes it pretty strong, but it can be, if it's cast iron, it's very brittle. The stone can break that and bring that rascal down real easy, okay? It breaks easy. 43, and whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they, who is they? They are the toes, okay? They shall mingle themselves with the seed of man, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. Now, when it says, do you know what the word uh, they, men is here? It's, it is um, the word in the Hebrew, enosh. Enosh. And the prime is they're, they're mortals, meaning flesh men, clay men. And the reason they don't cleave is the toes are supernatural. Okay? This is important. You're going to have to get used to it. We'll give further documentation. They want to mingle with clay men. Well, what happened back before the flood of Noah? The Nephilim came down and tried to mix with the Enosh, that's to say flesh people. And Geber were born unto them. And as we know from scripture, it's going to happen again. But the important thing is, as you see the composite of this system all together, we see that these ten kings, which these toes represent, are not kings of the earth. And you better get set for it, or you would be deceived. They are supernatural entities, the same ten horns mentioned in Revelation 12. So are the toes. They're supernatural beings. They're fallen angels. They don't mix with Enosh. God won't put up with it. That's why he brought the flood of Noah. But as you well know, they're going to try it, okay? What happens after this when they try to mix? This is one thing God won't tolerate. Verse 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. That's the Lord Jesus Christ and God's elect as they fulfill the written word of the end times. So this in a sense wakes you up to the fact that we're talking about a specific period of time. 
That's to say, after Satan and the fallen angels are kicked out of heaven as it is written in Revelation chapter 12, verse 7. That's why there was silence as we read this morning in heaven for half an hour, which is a figure of speech. But look out on earth. They're coming and they're going to be up to their old tricks. But Christ, when he destroys them this time as the prophecy in the very beginning, 316 stipulated, it's over. Christ is forever. It's going to be forever. And he is coming. One more verse, 45. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, God doesn't need man's help, but he likes his children to help him. <clears throat> and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath uh, made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain, and then the interpretation thereof sure. Now let me tell you something. When God makes an interpretation clear, when he interprets through a prophet, you want to be careful how you mess with it. It's one thing to be given a parable and for you to figure it out. But if God gives you the answer in the interpretation, it's usually a pretty good idea to accept that. Christ, the chief cornerstone, shall destroy the wickedness of the iron trying to mix with the clay bodies, mingle, that means marriage, and he'll put a stop to it. That will bring about the end. As we stated in Fault Fellowship, God won't put up with cloning or with this sort of thing. Just won't put up with it. Chapter 8, just as we, and then we're going to leave Daniel. Chapter 8, verse 23. We're going to go to the very end. Bear in mind, now there's a whole history of nations that play out this image. But at the very end, the whole thing comes into view. And they cohabit or they coexist. And that is the king of Babylon that God will bring down through the sun. Verse 23, chapter 8, book of Daniel. And in the latter time in their, of their kingdom, this is speaking of the beast system again, when the transgressors are come to a full, a king of furious countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. That means he understands the word of God even. Dark, it means hidden things that, that are hidden to some people. I pray it's not hidden to you, beloved. Verse 24, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. Why with lies and prosperity for one thing. 25, and through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. When, when he has supernatural agents as kings, it's pretty easy to make things uh, uh, happen in hand. That would be a very uh, large miracle to a mortal man. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. Did it say by war? No, by peace. When, when those certain kings appear with that false one. I tell you this, you better be prepared or even the elect would be deceived if that were possible, but it's not, not at all. He shall also stand up against the prince of peace, a prince, a prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. How's he gonna be broken? We just read it, the toes, his supernatural entities that he sets up as kings. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. It won't be until the end. Well, beloved, I, I got good news for you. You're living in the generation. Nobody knows the hour or the day or anything else. But you're living in the generation where 
I believe all these things shall come to pass. And uh, well, how long is that generation? However long God wants it to be, okay? But the wise shall understand. Now, in as much as we've had a look at this week framework, as we stand off and look at the composite, I mean, a golden head, that's really, you know, that's, that's um, pretty high priced merchandise and it's heavy, it's solid. But it goes on down and it's really got a weak spot. Now, if you have an enemy, you want to know where his weak spot is, okay? Well, God's good to you, He's to he tells you, okay? Now, what about our side? What about the Prince of, of uh, Peace? What about the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's go to Revelation chapter one. Revelation chapter one, we're gonna take a look at our King and see if there is a weakness there. Revelation chapter one, verse 10. We're gonna start there because I wanna fix a time for you. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. We kind of studied that this morning, didn't we? Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia and unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos and into Thyatira, and into Sardis, and into Philadelphia, and into Laodicea. These are the seven churches. We know that only two of them have the truth out of the seven. That's knowledge that's very valuable to you, beloved, spiritually speaking, all right? Don't forget it. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And of course, you know this is the seven churches. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man. God, through the Son, is always in the center of the churches. He especially helps those that do His work. As you heard this morning, what do they do? They take forth His Word. They absorb this book. And, and again, I, I, I'm always afraid I'm going to... Uh, create in someone's mind, I've got to just spend full time. That's, you only have, you can only retain a certain amount of material at one time and you got to let it rest and you got to meditate on it. You got to chew on it. And uh, so I don't want to create any religious fanatics, okay? Absorb the book. Don't struggle at it. It's simple. A child can understand it, all right? If you just, that's true wisdom to break it down. The Son of Man, Jesus Christ, is always in the center of the candlesticks, which is the churches. And one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. We don't see any corruption in this. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. Why? Because God is a consuming fire. God's fire warms us, it burns the enemy. And his feet, let's see if you see any clay or anything mixed here. And his feet likened to fine brass as if they burned in a furnace. I mean, that means all impurities gone, okay? You know what a furnace does. And his voice as the sound of many waters, like that voice of the seventh angel. The word of God, he is the word of God. His voice carries power, strength, comfort to you, to the world, for those that will absorb that truth. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. What, what is that sword? What comes out of your mouth? Your voice. The truth. It's a two-edged sword. It cuts both ways. The enemy can't stand in front of it. We're in combat, friends, between Satan and God. You got to choose sides. And the only way you can really choose sides and be fit for any service is to be disciplined and trained by absorbing the book, by understanding it, by knowing. 
And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not. I am the first and the last. I am he that, be, that uh, liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive evermore. I'm not going to be crucified anymore. Amen. And have the keys to hell and death. He defeated death. And he has the keys to hell to put whoever he chooses in the lake of fire. But he doesn't use that, as many do, to, as a threat. It's simply a fact. And fact should be considered. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. You write them because they go into the book that my people are supposed to absorb, to digest. Now, as I said, get used to it. When God interprets a saying or a vision, you have no right to fool with it. Okay? It's clear. He said what it was, that's it. Listen to it. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my hand, right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. sticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. No big deal. Don't mess with that. It, it's interpreted for you. And if you mess with it, then you would certainly be interpreting God's word past what he did. He doesn't like that. Now, inasmuch as we know that two of those candlesticks he was very pleased with, and inasmuch as we know that a stone is being formed, I'm not going into the churches. There's no need to. You're all familiar with it. But I do want you to go to that chapter 2. And I want you to look at the 17th verse, and I want you to think on it long, hard. I want you to absorb it. I want you to digest it. Verse 17, chapter 2, Revelation. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna. Do you know what manna is? That's food from God. It comes down from God. It's truth. And will give him a white stone. Underline it in your mind. Give him a what? A white stone. And in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. The word stone here is sephas. It's much like the word count as it is utilized in the 18th chapter, 18th verse of the 13th chapter to count the number of the beast. Do you know what this stone is? It makes that part of the stone that bruises the feet if you have wisdom to absorb it. It is also translated as a vote, a pebble worn smooth over a long period of time Meaning, from Genesis 3.15 all the way through the Word of God. Understanding the Word of God and being part of the makeup of a stone that can cause our enemy a great deal of difficulty. Only those can learn it that wish to partake of the Word of God. So, foise is to say, to have a vote on what's going to happen. You know, does God trust you that much? That's written. It's what it says. The stone's going to destroy the enemy. I just wonder, I don't know, have you received yours yet? Do you, do you have anything that brings a little peppering to Satan? Do you take names and kick dragon? Or are you, you know, one of these that says, oh, well, maybe... Someday, maybe someday, absorb your father's word. You're living in times that things are beginning to solidify and you need to be aware. So, a new name written, a white stone, Hebrew, Eben. 
Eben, the same as the stone that uh, is a part of the family or the makeup that brings hurt to our enemy. You know, you got to remember, Christ sat down at the right hand of God and he's going to stay there until his enemies are made his footstool. Who do you think is going to make his enemy his footstool? Do you think he's, it's just going to happen? Or do you think that God has a people that in holding to truth, because that two-edged sword cuts terribly against lies, against deception. Let's go to Revelation chapter 17. Don't forget about the stone. It's important. Chapter 17 is where we came to in the last Passover. We're going to recover just a little bit of it. And we're going to take it much further than we did in the last uh, Passover. Why? It's time. Time for what? Time to learn more. Time to advance. Chapter 17, verse 1, Revelation. And there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither. That means, like, come over here. I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. I'm, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen to her. Now, you all know that these are the people that are deceived in this world. Now, verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have, made, have been made drunk, of the wine of her fornication. Now listen to me. You would make a grave mistake if you confuse the kings of the earth with the ten toes or the ten horns because they're supernatural. Kings of the earth are just that, earth. All right? You got to make a division in your mind here. We're talking about we're talking about ten, you're talking about earthly kings that three of the old ribs are going to end up in one of those others' mouth and say, eat flesh, Enosh, mortal man. Not literally, but spiritually. You must separate in your mind here and now that these kings of the earth are not the ten toes or ten horns that will be coming up on in a minute for they are supernatural. This is not a great step for you because you know in Revelation chapter 12 where it talks about Satan in the first earth age that he had these same horns. Okay? He had the same horns way back then. And they're coming with him. Well, they're certainly not human beings, all right? That's, that's no step for a stepper, all right? Step it with me, all right? Separate the kings of the earth from the kings we're going to be talking about soon. Verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads, that's seven kingdoms, and ten horns, meaning ten kings. Got seven dominions. We covered those in the last Passover. Now we're going to talk about those ten kings. Four, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet, scarlet color. That means royalty. Oh, she's something else. And decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, her idolatry, her having been deceived. Five, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and an abomination of the earth. And it is. You know, um, kind of get a hold of this for a minute. We kind of take it for granted. But when Almighty God that created all souls, when his children become so lax, undisciplined, that they will allow their very enemy, Satan, to take the place of Jesus. And that's exactly what instead of Christ means. You would think there's no way that could happen. Don't ever kid yourself, my friends. 
Deception on the unlearned falls easily on the ear. They do not have ears to hear. Verse 6, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Astonishment would be a better translation. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore dost thou marvel? Why do you let this get to you a little bit? Okay? Wherefore dost thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. Do you understand what that said? He said, you don't have to interpret it. I'm going to do it for you. Well, you know, that's neat because that's God taking care of his own. Because some of us might never get it if he didn't. Okay. But whatever you do, don't ever uh, hanky with what God interprets. Okay. Verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. Now you all know that only fits one being, one entity. And the sentence was passed upon him in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19. There's no ABC. The, the, he's it. God told him there, I'm going to turn you to ashes from within, being the fake rock. Um, and, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder. Did it say the fallen angels would? No, so those that dwell on earth whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they beheld the beast that, uh, behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. They're going to be deceived. Some of you had your names in the book before the foundation. Why? He didn't suck you in in the first earth age. Now, here's where we lose a lot of people, okay? I'm sorry, but it's true. A lot of people don't know that there was a first earth age. Can you believe that? I mean, we go out here on documentaries and we uncover material that's millions of years old and it's almost embarrassing to us to have college students come up to us and say, are you all are Christians? Well, what are you doing out here? This stuff is billions, this stuff is thousands and thousands of years old. And I said, that's why we're here, son. It is here. And the Bible declares it. It's just that some Christians just their elevator doesn't quite reach the top deck, okay? It's sad. It really, it's embarrassing to have young people that are educating themselves, you know, say, what are you doing out here, you know? And if, if, if uh, Christian teachers had been on the ball or been doing what they're supposed to do, this wouldn't happen. I know, I'm just winning friends here and influencing people in the secular, the clerical world, cleric, what do we call them? Well, I, I have a name for them and I'll let that do for the time being. We have some good men and women that really try to serve. And there's not a one of us in here that couldn't say at one time, but by the grace of God, there go I. But there is a difference if your name was written before. In other words, you wouldn't buy the stuff Satan put out in the first earth age. And you fought against him, earning the right. God doesn't give away any free rides. He's fair. You either earned it or you didn't. Or you're willing to uh, bully up to the wheel and make uh, an effort. All right? Free will is what I'm talking about. Okay. So it's very important that you absorb from the foundation of the world. And you know that the Greek verb there is katabo, before the overthrow of Satan. Verse 9, and here is the mind which hath wisdom. Listen carefully. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. These are kingdoms, okay? And we're going to break them down again, seven of them. And there are seven kings. These are earthly kings of, that were over those uh, dominions, okay, basically. Or kingdoms. Don't, don't call it kings. Kingdoms. Uh, there were seven, five are fallen, one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. That kind of answers it for you. Listen to me. When you look at the statue we first covered, golden head and so forth, number one was Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Number two is Medo-Persia. Number three was Greece. 
Number four, Rome. Number five, the Mohammedan uh, kingdom reigned there from 636 AD up until the year of our Lord, 1948, which happened in this same generation that many of us senior citizens now live. Now, in 1948, in came the sixth kingdom, which is the good and the bad fig tree. But there is a seventh coming. He's called Antichrist, okay? He's kicked out of heaven, and he's coming. Those are the kingdoms. I mean, that's pretty, look, you, you know, many might say, well, how could you say that? Well, have you watched television the last two days? Are you, are you, are you, um, a news hound, just a little bit. I mean, things are happening, all right? And I'm not saying it's all going to come down tomorrow, you know, or when. I don't know. But I know one thing. I am wise enough to know that 1948's getting quite a ways out there. And this one's just got a short space. And he's about to run out of space, all right? Things are about to happen. And you want to be alert. Verse 11, and the beast that was and is not, that goes back to the eighth verse, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. See, that kind of answers it for you. As we said, there's only one that goes into perdition, so that, that takes the, all the guesswork out of it. You can, you can rest on that as a fact, okay? Because that is the false messiah. That is Satan, whatever the drag, whatever name you want to call him. The eighth, and he's of the seven. In other words, he's been in that picture all along. But we brought the whole composite into view now. Okay? It's time. We're up to that last kingdom. Verse 12. And the ten horns. Now here we go. Which thou sawest are ten kings. They are not. I emphasize, they are not kings of the earth. There are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet. Why? They're not here yet. But receive power as kings one hour with the beast. In other words, as it's written in uh, Revelation 12, 7, Michael and his angels will cast Satan and his angels out onto this earth. Woe to you that are on the earth. Then, and then only, do you have the ten supernatural kings here on earth. Well, why is that so important? You better know what your enemy is. You better know what you're dealing with. Or you're liable to get sucked in yourself, okay? It's that simple. They're good. They're good at what they do. If you, you know, most anybody can stand up to the average person, man, human. And you can put up a pretty good argument, debate, I'll say. We're not talking about Enosh. We're not talking about mortal beings. We're talking about supernatural people that, that have a, a knowledge of things and have powers we don't have except through Christ. And that's why it's important to you to know. That's why it's important for you to know who you're up against. Does that frighten you? It shouldn't. We got power over them. Okay? He's promised that. But you still have to know who your enemy is, what you're dealing with. They are not earthly kings. They are not earthly people. They are fallen angels cast out of heaven when Satan is. They have no kingdom yet because they don't get it till he gets here. Do you think he's going to let mere mortals set up and run his kingdom here on earth? Ain't no way. Not when he's got supernatural brains, minds, that he can cast around and bring everything under their control peacefully. Big Daddy's home. Everything's cool. You don't have anything to worry about. Love me because I love you. Well, that's, that's reasoning by peace. Why did he call her a harlot? Because she'll play any tune he wants her to play. And he will play her like a fine fiddle. And 
most of the churches are going to go along with it. I'm sad to say that. I wish I didn't have to say that. You know it and I know it. Because one of the messages he'll be teaching is, Dear little ones, we've come to fly you away. We're going to scoot pretty soon. Like a firefly in the night. Woo! Beep, bleep. We're gone. We're out of here. You know? And probably put on a few shows. You know? Do a few miracles. They are not human beings. They are supernatural. These kings are. Don't worry about it. We can handle them. But be aware of it, or you could be deceived. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay. Verse 13. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Naturally. He's their hero. He's their man. Okay. 14. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. They can't beat us. You got that? Never forget it. Absorb it. We beat them. They don't beat us. Why? We know their game. Why? It's written. You see, God interpreted this for us. He said, look, come, don't, let that, don't let that mess you up. It's this simple. And he interprets the whole thing for us. Verse uh, 18, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. The ten kings, what did it say? It said which reigneth over the kings of the earth, mortals. The deception takes them over. Boy, look around you today. All leaders, so-called kings of the earth, that deception basically overrides anything good they might want to do. It sure works hard at it. Okay. You're living in an exciting time. And never, never. You know, God provided us a nation. It's a fantastic nation. The greatest superpower of all times here in this generation. Do you think Satan controls it? No way. We're a free people. And God will not allow as long as that free people stands its ground, exercises its power and its authority. We're blessed indeed and don't ever forget it. But the deception does run rampant. I thank God for the worldwide network that he has allowed or has established for us that we are able to offset many things and to share many truths with people that need that truth. And it's, people are starving today for facts instead of fairy tales. I had a guy, a letter from a man. He said, boy, the first time I heard you, I got so mad I couldn't hardly stand it. And my wife and I said, we're going to show him. We're going to show him that Eve ate an apple. And we got out our Bibles and we started looking and pastor, we can't find apple. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, you know, I received some precious mail from precious people, but I received mail from, uh, well, I won't go into that. That's private. But anyway, it's great. Okay. God explains things for us. If you let him, you know, do I have the right to ask you to accept that those ten kings, which are the horns, are supernatural? Well, I would simply say to you, go back to Revelation 12. They're on that sucker before this earth age was formed. And they're still there. And they're still there when he comes out in Revelation 13. Is that hard to figure? You know, that ciphers out pretty good, doesn't it? Well... They're supernatural, and they try to mingle with men, only they hate men. And, uh, and so it is. Okay, excuse my back. Go with me now to Matthew chapter 24. All of you know exactly what I'm going to read. Matthew 24. I don't have to tell you.
Verse 36, Matthew 24, New Testament. Jesus talking, giving the seven events that shall transpire in the seven seals, and the seven trumps. Verse 36, Matthew 24 reads, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. My Father knows. Verse 37, he gives you a clue. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the, also the coming of the Son of Man be. Well, well, what in the world does that mean? Well, Noah's Noah, okay? Why did Noah, what was Enoch preaching? Don't mix with those fallen angels. And Enoch was such a good preacher and accomplished enough that at least he kept one family totally clean of mixing with the fallen angels, the supernatural beings. One family only. And Enoch was so good, God just took him. But you know what happened to the others? The Nephilim, coming from the Hebrew prime, Napha, meaning fallen, the fallen angels, partook of women, like them, pretty. Well, I, I, you know, you have to agree. Okay. And, and uh, took them to wife, and children were born, and they were giants, Geber bad. That's what was going on. Well, what are those ten kings going to be doing? Same thing. That's what Jesus is telling you. They're supernatural. They were here then in Genesis chapter 6 and they're going to be again. Um, verse 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, mingling the clay with the iron, as God would detest until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. It's going to be just like that. Well... Certainly, Revelation chapter 17 agrees with that. Daniel chapter 2 agrees with that. They try to mingle, just like they did during the time of Noah. And to mingle, their location is quite easy to understand. It's here. Well, this is where we live. That's what I'm telling you. Get set. Be prepared from your father's word to no one to understand what shall be ahead. When is it going to happen? No one knows. But the father knows. Do you trust him? Would you want it to happen any sooner than God wants it to? No way. There's God, there's souls, your brothers and sisters that need help. We're going to do it. Okay. We're going to get it done. Watch their 42, let's see, uh, 40. Then shall two be in the field, and the one shall be taken, and the other left. A lot of churches, as you've heard me teach many times, say, Oh, dear God, they were raptured right out of there. No, they were taken by the Antichrist and by the Nephilim. That's the subject, okay? Don't change the subject on God. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, and the one shall be taken, and the other left. The smart one was left doing God's work. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. That hour is coming, and he continues on and says, The ones working in my field, the world, and stay there till I return. I'm going to bless them big time. Are, are you one of those? Or do you want to be taken up in deception? You like to mess around with fallen angels, the ten kings of the earth that have only just a short time? <clears throat> What about the stone? That big stone that brings this whole thing crashing down. The feet are brittle. I mean, there it stands with that heavy load up top, the gold and the silver. And man, that old clay mixed down there with iron, just one good lick. Bam! That whole thing is coming down. Who's going to do it? Christ is, of course. What about your stone? Is it going to be in the same pot? Where's your vote? The word means vote as well, okay? Have you ever heard of drawing lots, drawing stones? Where does yours go? 
God wants people that will align with him. And if your name is written in that book, you are. He knows it. Okay, in conclusion, next to the last book of the Old Testament, you know, you could teach the whole Bible from the book of Zechariah. We're going to talk about the stone some more. You know that in Zechariah chapter 3, you, don't, don't, you, can, you know it. I don't, all I have to do is remind you. There was a stone that had seven pairs of eyes. And it was God's elect. And it was a stone that God considered pretty precious. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 7. This is concerning the downfall of Babylon, the downfall of the beast. Verse 7, Who art thou, O great mountain or nation, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain. I'm going to flatten you. You're going to be a net thing. And he shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Who's the headstone? You, you just got one guess. It's Christ, of course. That's the headstone. Christ is going to bruise his head by hitting his feet. Okay, you going to be a part? Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you being the Lord Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, the truth, the word of God. 10, listen carefully. For who hath despised the day of small things? Do you think it's a small thing that God has given you power over all of your enemies? It's not small. Do you think the fact that God has given us common people the victory over Satan and all those supernatural entities? You, is that a small thing? It kind of is to our Father. And you shouldn't consider it to be too big a thing. Small things happen with small people when God's with them. For they shall rejoice and shall see thee plummet. Do you know what this word plummet is? It's stone. Stone. In the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. Seven what? Seven thousand. God's elect. The sign of completeness that we talked about uh, early this morning. They are the eyes of the Lord. They're what? Those 7,000 are the eyes of the Lord? Who do you think does his work on earth? Let, you know that he, he addresses, that he challenges. Which run to and fro through the whole earth. Meaning they're scattered around the world and they do the work of God. And they are that rock. Do you know what a plummet is? It's a plumb bob. Right? It's, if you were to take the Hebrew word to the prime, it's a stone of separation as well. Okay, it kind of separates the would bees from the bees. Right? Those that have the truth and those that don't. And it holds that line out there with those seven eyes, the God's elect, that are a part of that stone. And that stone has a great part to do with bringing about the end ultimately as far as God's work is concerned. Have you received your stone yet? Think about it. It's a figure of speech now. It's spiritual. Okay. Then answered I and I said unto him, oh, what are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches which through the two golden pipes empty the oil, golden oil, out of themselves? That's, when, if you go back to the tree, that's the Holy Spirit. The word comes through the Holy Spirit. Not by gravity. Not by uh, man, a pump. It flows by the act and the action of the Holy Spirit in your heart, mind, body, and soul through the people of the world. God knows what he's doing. 
trust him. Stick to his word. Olive oil, the oil of our people. Well, what does that oil do? Nothing. But it's obedience, your obedience and discipline in believing and utilizing to know where to go for truth. 13, and he answered me and said, Knowest thou not what these be? I said, Nope, my Lord. And he, then he said, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. The two anointed ones, what does anointed mean? Anointed with the oil. And naturally, uh, you can take that to the two witnesses of Revelation. Hey, we got work to do. There are 10 kings coming that are separate from the kings of the earth. Be prepared for it, be set. Is that a big step? No, it's really not. It's been there all the time. And let me ask you another question. Was it not interpreted by God that it was there all the time? Of course it was. You know how to trace those 10 horns? There's no big thing about it. And Jesus himself said, hey, no big deal. They were doing it back in Genesis chapter 6. It was there. They were here. So, we're living in a time when you need to really be awake spiritually. Want to be a part of that stone. Want to possess that stone of truth, that hidden manna that helps you deal in these end times, that helps you to understand we've got nothing to fear. We're God's children and we do have work to do and do you know something? We're going to get it done. We're going to take names. We're going to kick dragons. You're not going to see too many whiny butts in this army that God's putting together. Ah, oh, dear God, if I could just get around to it today, bye. You know, bye. You know, God likes people that he can depend on. Don't you? If, if you've got a really rough job to do, do you want a, a whiny diny? Maybe I better clean that up a little bit, okay? You know, I'd like to help you today, but I got to... I got to go play a round of golf. I've got to go goof a while. Well, you know, do you want friends like that? You know, so concentrate. Don't become a fanatic of any kind. Speak God's word to those that have ears to hear. Never dump truth above the ability of some child Christian that means anywhere from 60 to 60 that they can't handle, okay? It'll, it'll, it'll overload their donkey. And you all know what that means, okay? They can't cut it. They can't handle it. You got to let them grow. Let me tell you something. It isn't important how much we know. It's whether or not we have the ability to teach our brothers and sisters and bring them where we are. Okay, spiritually speaking.